I'm Dr. Wilfred Graves, Jr., and I would like to welcome you to a special three-part holiday series by the Three Bible Teachers. This will be our final three sessions for the year, but we look forward to seeing you again in January for more exciting sessions. The three-part series that we will introduce tonight is entitled, A Biblical Look at Christmas. A Biblical Look at Christmas. And so we will look at Christmas. We will look at its origin. We will look at its biblical principles and the true meaning of the holiday. Dr. Oscar Owens, Dr. Kenneth Hammonds and I are thrilled that you have joined us this evening. And so we look forward to your participation in these three sessions. Many of you have been attending our series, Healthy Habits of the Christian Life, and we hope that you have been enjoying that series. Now, if you are new to the Three Bible Teachers experience, we want to invite you to visit our website, threebibleteachers.com. If you visit that site, especially the blog section, you will be able to watch videos of past sessions. You will be able to look at homework assignments and also download other materials that will benefit you in your Christian walk. Now, this three part series is streaming on the website at threebibleteachers.com slash Christmas. And so there you will be able to watch any of the three sessions and you also will be able to get the supplemental notes. And so if you don't have the notes to tonight's session, I invite you to download it now from threebibleteachers.com slash Christmas. Now, if you would like to uh, connect with me personally, I invite you to send an email to threebibleteachers at gmail.com. Or you can visit my personal website, wilfredgraves.org. I'd love to hear from you. I would like to begin tonight's session by introducing two biblical concepts that I'm sure you're already familiar with. These concepts are monotheism and trinity. Monotheism and trinity. Monotheism is belief in one and only one God. Trinity, which means three in one, indicates that the one God is revealed as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity affirms that there is one and only one God who is eternally existent in three persons identified as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Father, Son, and Spirit are not three different gods. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God in three persons. A person is an individual center of rational consciousness. I am a person. You are a person. Angels are persons. A person thinks, a person communicates, a person makes choices, a person is fully self-aware, etc. So each member of the Trinity fulfills the definition of a person. Now think about it. The opposite of personal is impersonal. A force is impersonal. Energy is impersonal. We can't have a relationship with that which is impersonal, but we can have a relationship with God. Now, let's take a look at a very simple diagram. This diagram depicts the concept of the Trinity. In the diagram, there is one God represented by the central circle. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Yet, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons represented by the outer circles. The Father is not the Son, 
The son is not the spirit and the father is not the spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity is one of the most important theological teachings of the Bible. So once again, the doctrine affirms that there is one and only one God who exists eternally in three persons identified as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So tonight we will focus on the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Our topic is Christmas and the miracle of the incarnation. Christmas and the miracle of the incarnation. The Christmas holiday is a celebration of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The word incarnation is a theological term for the coming of God's son into the world as a human being. Because Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Christ, it is really a celebration of the incarnation. Incarnation literally means to become flesh or to take on flesh. The term incarnation refers to the fact that Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. The incarnation is the event described in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John 1 and verse 1 reads as follows. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Several verses later in John 1 and 14, the text reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 contains some of the most powerful statements about Christ in the New Testament. These verses which we have read teach us that Jesus Christ is both God and man. He is the divine word that became a human being. First, Jesus is fully God. This statement is consistent with other statements that we find throughout the New Testament. Jesus said of himself, for example, in John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was born, I am. Now God had revealed himself to Moses as I am in Exodus chapter three. So Jesus clearly applied this divine name to himself. And there are a number of other New Testament references to Jesus's divine nature. For example, God the Father declared that Jesus is his son. Those to whom he ministered confessed Jesus as the Christ, the son of God. Peter declared that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. Thomas also addressed Jesus as my Lord and my God. Jesus claimed that he would judge the world. Now that's something that only God can do. Jesus also claimed that he would be honored just as the Father is honored. Jesus claimed that to see him is to see God. Jesus claimed that he could forgive sin. Now, only God can forgive sin, so Jesus is claiming to be God. Jesus also accepted worship, and he claimed that he and the Father are one. So according to the New Testament witness, Jesus Christ is fully God. Now, some skeptics might say, now, I know that the Bible claims that Jesus is God, but can we trust the New Testament accounts. Now, my quick answer to this is absolutely. As a theologian and a church historian, I can assure you that the New Testament Gospels are reliable documents of history that accurately portray the early church's encounter with Jesus. 
and they give a trustworthy account of his birth, of his life, of his miracles, of his death, burial, and resurrection. But you definitely don't want to miss next week's session. Dr. Kenneth Hammonds will help us to understand why we can believe what the Bible claims about God, about Jesus, about miracles, and about truth. His session will be called Christmas and the Reliability of the New Testament. You definitely don't want to miss next week's session. So Jesus Christ is fully God. Yet Christ is not only fully God, but he's also fully human. When the word became flesh, he came to earth through the womb of the Virgin Mary and he was born as Jesus. So Jesus participated fully in what it means to be human. He was a real man with a real physical body. He began his life as a baby. He had a normal childhood. He experienced hunger and thirst, just like all other human beings. He sometimes became tired. He sometimes uh, wept and cried. Uh, remember at the tomb of Lazarus, it said that Jesus wept. The text also says that Jesus functioned with limited knowledge. He became angry at times. And as we all know, he bled and ultimately died on the cross. Human beings experience death. Yet what is so remarkable is that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is simultaneously both divine and human. In Jesus, God began to live a fully human life. So according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. This is the wonderful miracle that we celebrate at Christmas, the miracle of the incarnation. That is that Christ is the fullness of God in a human body. So to summarize the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, it affirms that God became flesh. He assumed a human nature and became a man. That man is Jesus Christ, the son of God and the second person of the Trinity. Now, the term incarnation does not appear in the New Testament, but the concept is certainly present there, as we have already seen. Among other New Testament passages, we find the teaching of the incarnation in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, Colossians 2 and 9, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, and 1 John 4 and 2. Now, we've already read uh, John and Colossians. And you can read the uh, other verses at home when you uh, get a chance. But I would like to read from uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, specifically verses 6, 7, and 8. These verses present a beautiful picture of the incarnation as an act of humility and service and sacrifice. And so according to this passage, Christ did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And of course, that was not the end of the story. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father. 
Yet remarkably, the joining of deity and humanity did not come to an end when Jesus ascended to the Father. Jesus retained his humanity and will forever be the God-man, our Lord and Savior, the perfect mediator between God and humankind. So the incarnation is a miracle that continues to bless the people of God, and it will do so for all eternity. Jesus is the God-man right now. Now, many Christmas traditions have developed through the years, uh, decorating Christmas trees, uh, giving of expensive gifts, uh, holiday baking of cookies and other types of treats, uh, wearing ugly Christmas sweaters, or watching Christmas movies. These are all fun traditions. Yet the incarnation is really what Christmas is all about. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, the angel of the Lord said to Joseph, Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The miracle that we celebrate during the Christmas season is that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, or God with us. The great hymn writer Charles Wesley extolled the wonders of the incarnation in the Christmas carol, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. Listen now to the second verse from that classic Christmas song. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. The incarnation is a wonderful blessing. God is forever joined with his people in the person of Jesus Christ. The miracle of the incarnation demonstrates that God does not just pity us from afar. Because he took on flesh, he shares in our human experiences. He shares in our joys and our sorrows, in our successes and in our failures, in our triumphs and in our tragedies. I love how Hebrews 4 and 15 reads in the New King James Version. It says that Jesus Christ can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Through his birth, through his life and ministry on earth, and ultimately through his redemptive work on the cross, Christ reveals to us that God is with us. God understands us, and God wants to rescue us from the things that would diminish or destroy us in our spirits, our minds, our bodies, our relationships, or other aspects of our humanity. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He is the God-man who desires for us to experience a full and vital relationship with him. As we approach the Christmas holiday, I invite you to focus on the wonderful reality that God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. We must praise our Heavenly Father for the gift of salvation and the great love that he reveals to us through his son. Hallelujah. Now, for the last few minutes of my presentation, 
I'd like to talk about why the miracle of the incarnation is important. And I will give you three reasons. And there, of course, are many other reasons, but I just want to highlight three of them. First, the incarnation is important because it demonstrates the love of God. The second person of the Godhead took on flesh. He limited his divine privileges. He subjected himself to the pains and the sorrows of human life and ultimately died on the cross to save us from our sins and to bring us eternal life. Now that's love. According to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Romans 5, 8 adds, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was born so that he could die for our sins and reveal the awesome love of God. Second, the incarnation is important because it is necessary for salvation. We know from history and from personal experience that human beings are sinners. We cannot save ourselves. Only God can save us. Yet for God to save us, somehow the penalty for sin, which is death, must be paid. And only man can pay that penalty by dying. Therefore, to pay the penalty for sin and to offer salvation to humankind, God united with man in the incarnation. Jesus Christ is now the perfect and final mediator between God and man. The third and final reason that I will give for the importance of the incarnation is that it was the best way for us to realize how to be fully human. The incarnation was the best way for us to realize how to be fully human. Through the incarnation, Jesus Christ gives us a perfect example of human life, a perfect example of the life that is committed to the will and the ways of God the Father, a life which is oriented toward goodness and oriented away from sin. He shows us what life was meant to be. Jesus Christ is our perfect role model who shows us how to receive eternal life and to experience an abundant life while on earth. And so I'll stop there. I hope that this teaching on the incarnation has been an encouragement to you and a blessing. I also pray that this Christmas will be a wonderful time of peace and joy for you and all your loved ones. Please join us next week for the second session of this three-part series. God bless you. I'm Dr. Wilfred Graves, Jr. I will see you next time. Well, here we are with another fantastic, fantastic Dr. Graves. The overview, the way you did it, the way you moved along, the incarnation. I would dare say, well, maybe we should do more, but I would dare say we, we talk about Jesus and we do all that in the Christian church, but we miss this incarnation. <clears throat> And I know we're doing this great, great series now, but what kind of led you to deal with the incarnation of all the things that someone could deal with, uh, with the Christmas? Well, what, what gave you this idea of the incarnation? Yes, I mean, it's such a, it's such a powerful uh, reality um, mm. that, that God took on human flesh, oh, man. That, uh, <clears throat> that Jesus Christ, was fully God and fully man in one person and will remain so forever. So that's what, uh, that's the part of it that uh, really ministers to me 
that God forever united with humanity. That's Doc, awesome. I got to interrupt. I know you don't like that, but I got to. You know why? That point knocked my socks off. <laughs> Never thought about the power of him that way throughout eternity. You had so many great points that, the, but that one, woo, man. Oh gosh, that was good. That was really good. It it, it kind of a uh, uh, blows me away uh, as well when I when I think about the depths uh, of God's love that mm. He would forever unite with us. Yes, right. So it, it's not just that Jesus um, uh, temporarily became human and then ascended back to His original form. He forever united with man. Now I'm not much of. Uh, uh, I'm not totally con understanding uh, Greek mythology, but I do know uh, every every now and then those gods would come down, quote unquote. But they heading back to where Olympus, whoever they they're not going to hang around, and they're certainly not going to unite with humanity because humanity is considered so inferior. So right. your your point about Christianity, maybe we maybe we got something here that. Uh, it's beyond that coming of some mythology. We've right. got some real contact with humans. Oh, it, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. I'm so glad you focused on this as we begin the celebration of Christmas. This is the heart of Christmas. There you that go. We don't talk about so much. This is the powerful truth, one of the greatest truths of Scripture that God becomes a human being. And as you're speaking, he eternally, he will always be the God man, the human oh, God. Hallelujah. Showing God's love for humanity and then showing us how we can become like him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hallelujah. Through his power and through his grace. It is, I, it is, it is uh, the most powerful and most amazing truth of Christianity. I, it, it is the truth that helped me get saved. Mm. When I finally, I, I grown up in church, but when I finally understood that God really became a human being, <laughs> for me, it was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> if God wants me to know mm. him, he's, he's become someone that I can I know it. and relate to, and he relates to me. And that's how I became a Christian. When I when I realized that, I was like, okay, I want to believe in you. I want to trust in you, Jesus. This is so powerful, Doc. And and, and you just expressed it so beautifully, so greatly. I, and and Dr. Graves, I love I love how you did that switcheroo at the end from the deep theologian to the coaching, encouraging wholeness of life part that was nice when you said the third point those are great points all of them uh, about why the incarnation is important when you said it's the best way for us to realize how to be fully human hallelujah matter right. of fact i heard you doc you threw a hallelujah in on this <laughs> <laughs> this is a hallelujah that fully yes. human that yes. that concept oh please just speak a little bit on that that that's so powerful. Yeah, and, and a lot of times uh, we we sort of diminish our humanity. Like you know, yes. uh, in our churches we say things like, uh, "I'm a spirit. I have a mind. I live in the body." Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But when God created us, body, soul, and spirit, yes. right? That's what it means to be human. Yes. Okay. And so that's what God wanted to say. Hallelujah. Right. Us in our full humanity. So good. So he joined together. Uh, with with uh, a physical body, right? Yes, so yes. that he could save humanity in a very uh, real sense. And so, you know, really, what God did in the incarnation, it really brings great dignity to us oh, as human beings. Good yes. point. Yes. So, so you look <clears throat> at this this tremendous condescension from God, yeah, right? Yes, yes, yes. In which he takes on human flesh and and lives uh, <clears throat> fully as a human, and not yes. just for a small short period of time but forever yes right i love it Hallelujah. And, and so so jesus not only saves us and and you know that that it's obvious why we need the incarnation for that well uh, yes. we need god to offer salvation we need a man to pay the penalty yes. for sin 
but also the model that Jesus lived as a man yeah, is yes. a model for us. Good. That's right. Good. Good. Right. So, yeah, you know, I mean, we could argue that if if Jesus is simply operating as God and doing good things, mm -hmm. that I could never measure up to that. I've got good. you. I've got you. Right? Yeah. But he he shows you what perfect humanity is. This is yes. the fullness of humanity. This mm -hmm. is what you, know, you, you should aspire to. So he's our mm -hmm. perfect example. He's our elder uh, brother. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. You know, th 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 this is what God intended humanity yes. to be. And in mm -hmm. Christ, he is helping us, making us like him. That, that is, we, we, we've got a different, we've got a destiny, an eternal destiny. Uh, or a reality beyond our understanding. <laughs> it's yeah. in Christ, and He pictures it for us. And as we look at Him, as we look to Him, as we focus on Him, as we imitate Him, as we walk after Him, we're becoming more like Him through the power of His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And and and, and I think you showed us the value again in this human. Uh, I love the phrase you used. He shares in human experience. That, mm -hmm. that phrase is just yes. so powerful. You maybe kind of said it then, but you said he shares That's right. in our human experience. Yes. What 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 love this is. And yes. for, as you said, to become an ant, I always said like us becoming an ant, to become that, but then to be willing to experience what they experience. Yes. Whew. Man, yes. the, the incarnation. I can't even think of John three sixteen anymore like I used to. That's right. <laughs> uh, I my mind went immediately. I, it always has. I have to tell you, my mind went immediately to the cross. Mm -hmm. He gave his only begotten son. Oh, okay, the cross. Hey, died on the cross. That's it. That that's where we run to. That's right. But as you brought it out, I thought, wait a minute. This is the same John who said John 1 14. Yes, right. Yes. Wow. For he came and tabernacled. He came down with us. We was wrapped in flesh. Yes. That's right. In flesh. And of course, as you know, in the original language, that was the emphasis when he got to verse 14. And he became flesh and mm -hmm. dwelt among us. I, so I'm sure. I didn't know that before. Thank you, Dr. Gray. I'm sure that John had in mind the incarnation. Yes. Yes, yes. we're going to yeah, move definitely. to his death on the cross and his resurrection. But when he said gave <sighs> the incarnation. Thank you. And it's so it. important, right? Um, uh, yes. That, 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 that Jesus experienced humanity from the very beginning to the very end, right? Yeah. So he, he yeah. was born as a baby. So he, yeah. he, he experienced birth. Yes. Uh, he experienced a normal uh, childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, these myths that we, you know, uh, hear about him creating clay pigeons and all of that. That's not that's not uh, the, 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 the Christ of, uh, of Scripture. No, right? no. That's a mythological, uh, uh, you know, uh, rendering of, of yeah. Christ. Jesus had a normal childhood. He was subject to his parents, uh, right. he got tired. He, uh, yeah, he got angry at, at times. Uh, yeah, he got moody and you know and hungry and, uh -huh. and everything that we experience as human beings, right? Yes, all of the limitations of humanity. The one difference being that he never sinned, mm -hmm. right? But he he experienced all the temptations that we experience. Yes, and he shows us how we can surrender ourselves to the will of the heavenly Father. Yes, yes. Right. So we, we look at him as our example. If he was anything else, some angel or something like that, he wouldn't be our example. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful point. He couldn't be our example. Good. It'd be nice, nice story, you know, but certainly not a reality in our, as you called it, experience. Uh, oh, man, that, that was... And Dr. Grace, as you said, he has <clears throat> felt our experience as human beings. He has, as you said, he's felt all the, all the emotions of humanity and he's felt the, uh, the disappointing emotions. He's, mm. felt, uh, mm -hmm. he's felt sorrow. He felt grief over his father's mm -hmm. death. Uh, and 
he's experienced what many, the majority of humans throughout history have experienced. He's experienced what it means to be a human under the oppression of someone that's more powerful, the Roman experience. He, he's experienced what it is. He, that's why he can identify with the least of these. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be mistreated. He knows what it is to be lied on. He knows what it is to be uh, mis, misseen as seen as something else. He, he's experienced mm. all that for us. And so then when we're going through that, we know that he can understand what we're going through and can lead us through it because it's not foreign to him. He's not one of those Greek mythological gods who doesn't understand humanity. That's right. He understands us and he's identified with us. That's right. Hallelujah. And, and, and it's so important that he fully God and fully human. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, Absolutely. And, and, and the fully human part is, is so profound. He wasn't just masquerading as a human. Yes. yes. <laughs> he wasn't That's temporarily a human. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. He, he wasn't secretly <laughs> tapping into his God power to live right. life as a human. He, said he, he was submitted to the will of God under the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's how we yes, have to submit yes, to God, yes, right? Yes. The power of, of, <clears throat> of the spirit never Absolutely. cease to be God. Yes. Right. Because only God can offer salvation and only God um, can, can deal with the full weight of sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yes. So, yes. Absolutely. So, so you, you have to have God himself uh, giving salvation to us. We can't yes, save yes, ourselves. Yes, no yes, human yes. being, can save himself uh, or save a group of humans, right? No, no human being can do that. Only God can do that. That's right. Right. But but only man can pay that penalty. Mm -hmm. Only man understands what we go through. Can only man can identify with us. And so he is the God man who's the perfect bridge between uh, the heavenly Father uh, and us. And, and, and let me tell you, man. You when you hit the part where you brought in what is so valuable today, which we've almost dropped, hymns of the faith. When you brought in that Christmas carol, whatever they would call it, but it's a hymn written to God <clears throat> and written. When you brought in what Wesley, right? Wesley had, had done. Wesley. When you picked that verse, I don't. I think that's verse two or three. Yes, I'm, that's I'm the not sure. Verse. <clears throat> When you, I, you know, I've sung it, whatnot, but when you went through it very slowly and you say, wait a minute, this is a theological masterpiece and yes. beautiful sound. It goes past, I don't mean to demean anybody, but it goes past the little Christmas trinket songs that we come up with, <laughs> something that sounds good. We can clap right. our hands and, and we just keep saying and repeat the same thing over and over. <clears throat> when you read that, I am sure and that uh, our viewers said, wow, look at that. This was a man who understood the power of the incarnation. The That's verses right. were just simply marvelous. I hope we keep that going in the midst of our Christmas time and we want to sing the latest tune and, oh, there's another one out. <clears throat> I hope we keep that one and those great ones that have that great message. But great idea of bringing it home to Christmas caroling. That was a beautiful idea. I really want to hear how that kind of jumped into your mind, the idea of, of, of the songs. That's just so important uh, to get the right song that you're gonna sing regarding the incarnation. Uh, yes. Is that one of your favorites or what? No, no, I, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, it is one of my favorites, but I wanted to um, rem remind people that that is the reason for Christmas. Good, good, good. Right. Uh, in, instead of, you know, singing about Santa Claus or Rudolph or, or whatever it is, we sing about white Christmases and things of that nature. <laughs> that if if Christmas is really about the incarnation, that a yes. part of some of the songs uh, that have been traditionally associated with Christmas are real powerful statements about yes. Yes. Uh, the theology. I love that we've started this series where it should start at the beginning. <laughs> and I love that uh, and we've reminded people to do things and maybe uh, part of what we can do in that song is remind people of the meaning of Christmas. And uh, I know we've said in a trite way, but I think the way you brought it 
uh, people have to think theologically. And I know people get upset when you say, oh, we're theological. No, no. no. Hey, when you say Jesus, you say theology. Okay. <laughs> when you say God, <laughs> you say theology. By the way, nice beginning on that with Trinity. That was, that was pretty cool. Oh, okay. yes. Nice beginning of this is where we're going with this right. incarnation. Yeah. Dr. Owens, any uh, final comments here? Thoughts? No, this is so wonderful. <laughs> It's a good place to help us start our Christmas meditation. All right. Dr. Graves, uh, would you have us to think about something before we go into the, the live session and, and see what's happening uh, as we speak with people? Yeah, just, 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 just contemplate. Just think about uh, what God has done uh, mm. for you. I mean, what Hallelujah. profound humility that God himself has. Mm. to take on human flesh and identify with us forever. I mean, that, that should just change your life. Oh, oh man. man. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I, all I heard myself saying over and over in your session was hallelujah. I mean, really, when I think of the incarnation, I literally outside, out loud said hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Well, this has been a very exciting session. Thank you, Dr. Graves, for digging deep into what we have here and helping us understand. And I know that uh, our audience, our, our students, our participants are excited to just chat with you a little bit more about the wonderful incarnation, the reason for the season, as they say. Hallelujah. Hey, all man. right. God bless all of us as we go forward. All right. God bless you.